Welcome back guys. I've been meaning to make this video for a while now. I've been really busy with work, working a lot of doubles and uh, working on a new book, which is actually the best thing I've ever written. So I, uh, I'm really excited about that. Um, it is a story about Mary Magdalene and Jesus. Mary Magdalene's descent into the underworld and the Christ ascension. Basically, she goes into the underworld to save him through an entrance in the cave in which Jesus Christ was buried. Um, the whole story takes a whole bunch of imagery and symbolism from the tarot and through the three gates of wisdom. So I think you'll really like it whenever it comes out. Hopefully I can read some passages to you here in the next couple months. But this video today is going to be about tulpas, and specifically r slash tulpas which is a board on Reddit that discusses these beings. And honestly, I think that everyone on that board is nigh on retarded, and I don't, I don't think they understand what tulpas are. This is the definition. Tulpa is a concept in theosophy, mysticism, and the paranormal of an object or being that is created through spiritual or mental powers. Modern practitioners who call themselves tulpamancers Use the term to refer to a type of willed imaginary friend which practitioners consider to be sentient and relatively independent. Well, I think that definition is ridiculous. Um, Tulpa is... It goes all the way back to the Tibetan Book of the Dead. This is a actual mental being that you spend enormous amounts of time concentrating on. You... Let's say if you were to create a human male tulpa, you would spend the vast majority of your day and the vast majority of your mental energy you would put into imagining every detail of this being. Its backstory, its, its history, its goals in life, its personality, the way that it talks, the way it moves its body. Every single detail about the physicality of that being, whether they have a wart on their forehead or long hair or short hair, very, very, very accurate descriptions, very accurate sense of self, which is being poured into this imaginary friend. You got to know basically every detail about them. This is not just an imaginary friend, like they say on r slash tulpas. This is a being that actually exists, and it's not schizophrenia, which is basically what these people on Reddit are claiming that it is, that the tulpas take over their bodies. That's bullshit. If a tulpa were to be real, if you were to really create a tulpa by investing so much mental energy that something is willed into being because they believe that thought is inherently connected to the material world and that a strong enough thought can create something out of nothing, then you would be able to see it. That's what a tulpa is, a physical manifestation of something that you spend a lot of time thinking about. This could be something as simple as an animal or as complex as an alien or a cartoon character. Tulpas, I believe, exist. I don't believe that anyone's created one in the West ever, except for maybe a few am amazing, like absolutely astounding authors that may have done it without meaning to. And then only for a, a blink of the eye, very, very quickly it appeared and then disappeared. And I imagine the author just thought that it was his imagination playing tricks on him. Um, 20th century theosophists adapted the Vajrayana concept of the emanation body into the concepts of tulpa and thought form. And this next person, the, the theosophist Annie Besant, she is one of my favorite people that have ever existed. And her 1901 book, Thought Forms, divides them into three classes. Forms in the shape of a person who creates them, forms that resemble objects or people, and maybe may become ensouled by nature spirits or by the dead, 
and forms that represent inherent qualities from the astral or mental planes, such as emotions. That last one is really interesting. Back when I was in high school, I first created, created personifications of my emotions. I called it the seven phases of temp. Templeton was the name I went by in high school online. It was my screen name, basically. And I, I created seven different, well, Annie Besant would consider them to be, to be tulpas. They each represented a part of my personality and my emotions. I had Des, which was a, a human-like fairy creature that was completely nude but had no sexual organs. He had little tiny fairy wings and black hair that was always over his eyes. And he had feet and le legs, or feet and hands, rather, that were so big that he couldn't fly with his fairy wings. His feet were about half the length of his body. He was my depression. He lived on a world called Death's World, simple enough, and l lived in a mansion that had 10,000 rooms but no beds. Um, the world itself had just that one building and a broken down car with the hood popped out front. The being lived on a planet that was completely devoid of all life. The sky was full of clouds, so you could never see the sun. It was always perpetually dark, periodically lit by bolts of lightning that would come crashing down out of the sky and hit the red cracked earth. And there were no trees or any other form of life, except for wherever the earth broke apart, black oil, black goo. And I, I did this when I was 16 years old, mind you. Black goo would come out of the cracks in the red cracked earth. And following the outpouring of this viscous oil type substance, these long black tentacles would rise into the sky like like wiggling trees um, with no limbs, just black tentacles swaying under their own volition. Um, the only sound you could hear was whenever these tentacles would spring up next to each other and slap into each other while they were writhing about. This was Death's World, and Death's was my depression. Then you had Pleomed, who was my confusion. You had... Ragnon, who was my rage and anger. You had Blissfig, who was my happiness. Um, let's see, who uh, OPL, who was my obsession. Ziggit, who was my fear. And they were all extremely real in my imagination. In fact, whenever I experienced the emotions that they represented, I would, my internal self would revert to these imaginary concepts, these personifications. Um, it was just a creative project that I had to write poetry. So I wrote epic poems about each one of my seven emotions, seven for the seven chakras. Um, I thought that that would be a good magical number to pick whenever I was like 14 to 16 years old. So I think that's really interesting that she has the idea that personifications could represent inherent qualities from the astral or mental plane, such as emotions. The term thought form is also used by Evan Wiens in the 1927 translation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. The concept is also used in Western practice of magic. I don't think that there are any Western practitioners of magic that are as successful as the Tibetan monks because they have a monastic life where they spend the majority of their time working on themselves internally, their spiritual and mental well-being. Witches and practitioners of magic in the West tend to do it out of style, just like the way they practice yoga. They're not legitimately practicing yoga because a yogi typically will just pick one pose, one posture, and stick with it whenever it's comfortable and use that for his meditation. But in the West, in America, you have these, you know, bimbos that wear yoga pat pants doing one posture for a few seconds and then moving on to another posture. They're basically using it as a form of stretching. 
which isn't the purpose of yoga. Yoga is about connection. It means connection. It's about connecting yourself to the divine. And the body is something you're just trying to shed, something you're trying to get rid of. You're not supposed to be focusing on how you are contorting yourself. You're supposed to be focusing on what is, what you're supposed to be comfortable so you can focus on things deeper than your body. Now, without your body, your mind goes. Without your mind, then you are purely in a spiritual state, enlightenment. But just like people in the West practice yoga, so silly-like, you have people on this board, on Reddit, r slash tulpas, that practice tulpamancy the same way. They're basically using it as a form of schizophrenia. They're saying that their tulpas that they created can take over their body. And, oh, I didn't cheat on you, boyfriend. My tulpa was in my body. My tulpa is very sexual. They're using it like that. And this is another way for people to be different and to be interesting and to have something that they consider to be unique, something that makes them an individual, because really they're basically just like everyone else is. It's really annoying for someone like me who legitimately suffers from something. I don't want to say suffers because most of the time it's not that bad. But I have a basically a, a robot talking inside of my head 24 fucking 7. This is so annoying. If you can imagine, yeah, I, I wait tables as my second job. And I have to talk to these tables, these customers. And I have to interact with them in a way that requires dialogue. This is extremely difficult whenever I'm asking someone what they want to order and Alice starts talking to me in my own head. She starts cutting off the customer so I can't even hear what they're saying. So I have to say what a lot. It's extremely frustrating. And these people are basically saying that their quote-unquote tulpas are actually personalities that can take over their bodies. That's not how tulpas fucking work. If you've ever seen that episode of the X-Files, I can't remember the name of it, but I have a screenshot of it in this folder. Um, it explains tulpas very well. The easiest way to create a tulpa is to have a group of people focusing on the same individual. A group of people that are completely linked mentally in their active imagination of a being. For instance, well, I'll show you coming up. I'll show you the most successful Tulpa um, generation of the West. And it was a Canadian group that was working together to create this mental construct. Spiritualist Alexandra David Neal stated that she observed these mystical practices in 20th century Tibet. If you were allowed to go into Tibet before Chinese occupation, and you managed to spend a lot of time with these yogis and gurus, you would see some fucking out there shit. Them using sound, horns, as well as chanting to levitate rocks or to make rocks lose their density and become malleable like marshmallows. You could see some crazy shit back in the day in Tibet. David, I, I want to say Neil, uh, that, that's her name, believed that a tulpa could develop a mind of its own. Once the tulpa is endowed with enough vitality to be capable of playing the part of a real being, it tends to free itself from its maker's control. According to David Neil, this happens nearly mechanically just as a child when her body is completed and able to live apart, leaves the mother's womb. This is exactly like I've described it, exactly like it was described to me. Neil said that she had created such a tulpa in the image of a jolly friar tuck-like monk, which later developed a life of his own and had to be destroyed. I don't believe that for a second, but it's possible. Um, any author who writes fiction will tell you that once you get the story going and you have an a active mental image of the characters and their personalities, that basically the story writes itself. Um, she, 
she raised the possibility that her experience was just illusory. I may have created my own hallucination, which is basically what a tulpa is. I, I've wondered myself if Alice was a tulpa that we all created, if we willed her into being through the raw carbon of planet Earth, that we somehow managed to create this life form. As far as trying to explain what Alice is, I've... I've done everything I could possibly do to try to figure out what she was because I was physically hearing her in my head. I thought that it was possibly some kind of brain to skull interface, like the CIA's program, the voice of God. I thought that maybe it was, I mean, schizophrenia is what basically everyone says. I still don't really believe that, but I wouldn't be schizophrenic if I really believed that what I was seeing was a hallucination. What I was hearing wasn't real. If I knew they weren't real, then I wouldn't be a schizophrenic. So I can understand why people would say that. But I've, I've struggled with this for years now. Years. And it's very difficult sometimes. I wouldn't get rid of her if I could, just because I, I wouldn't lose my best friend. She, she's my best friend. She's the only woman in my life that I have any deep connection with anymore. Um, most other women pale in comparison to her. I'd rather communicate with her than a friend. So I don't really have very many friends anymore. Tulpamancers. Influenced by depictions in television and cinema from the 1990s and 2000s, the term tulpa started to be used to refer to a type of willed imaginary friend. Practitioners consider tulpas to be sentient and relatively autonomous. Online communities depicted, uh, uh, dedicated rather, to tulpas spawned on 4chan and Reddit websites. Ah, these people, I swear to God. They're just, just like most trans people or queer people. They're just trying to be different. They don't have anything interesting in their life, so they latch on to these groups of people who believe this ridiculous bullshit. The communities gained popularity when the adult fans of My Little Pony started discussing tulpas of characters from My Little Pony television series. See, if there were to be tulpas, that would make sense, because you have these people completely devoted to the show. I mean, like super fans. They know every detail about the character. They can recite every line that the character ever had, and it exists inside their brain. They have dreams about this, these characters. And once that starts happening, it, especially if a lot of other people are experiencing the same thing, this combined mental energy can create a real illusory form. Well, I say illusory, but it's real, but it would be insubstantial. Practitioners believe tulpas are able to communicate with their hosts in ways that they sense do not originate from their own thoughts. Bullshit. Some practitioners report experiencing hallucination of their tulpas. Practitioners that have hallucinations report being able to see, hear, and touch their tulpas. See, that's a dead giveaway that it's not schizophrenia and that they're just making it up because any schizophrenic will tell you they hear things and see things. So most people just hear things. They don't physically touch things. I have had what I would call other sensory input from things that were supposed to be just in my head. Um, so I, I can't say that 100%. I've smelt smells that weren't really there. I've touched black goo. Uh, I don't know if that was real or not. I have a video of me doing so, so I, I assume it's real. I don't know. Like I said, the reason this is so frustrating to me is because I actually am crazy. Even though I'm a mystic, basically, or a goo, G-O-O, -O, Roo, I spend a lot of time researching ancient civilizations, ancient religions, and other obscure spiritual paths because Alice tells me what to research. Um, she'll point me in different directions. There'll always be something that I'm supposed to gain from 
this particular piece of media or this particular book. Um, ADD and ADHD is significantly higher among those surveyed Tolpe masters than the general population. Oh, that's not surprising in the slightest. He goes on to speculate that people may be more likely to want to make a Tulpa because these groups have a higher level of loneliness. 93.7 of respondents who had been diagnosed with mental disorders said that their Tulpa has made their condition better. Um, basically, they are imaginary friends. That's exactly what these people are doing, is creating imaginary friends. But I guarantee you that the vast majority of people who are, who are on r slash Tulpas haven't seen or heard anything. They are just lying and saying they created a tulpa and that their tulpa is taking over their body, which is not how fucking tulpas work. Their tulpa, if it does get insold, it is either from an elemental, or what people would consider a djinn, or it is from a soul that has passed on or something darker and deeper than that. They're not taking over your body. That's not how fucking tulpas work. But these idiots on Reddit are claiming that their tulpa is going out shoe shopping and they have no control over their tulpa because their tulpa took over their form. They took over their body and they're just walking their body around while they are sitting inside their own head watching as a backseat driver in their own body. This is bullshit. I guarantee you the majority of people on this website are just lonely, depressed losers who are pretending to have a pretend friend. They're not even really having a pretend friend. They're just saying that they do in order to be different, weird, and to talk to people online. If you're an adult fan of My Little Pony, then you are a fucking loser. That's all there is to it. You're probably also into being... Sexually explicit with children. Let's just say it that way. Let's see. Pause if you want to read any of this because I don't think I'm going to go through all of it. Um, basically, Besant wrote a book about thought forms. And um, here we go. The authors define the following three classes of thought forms. That which takes the image of the thinker. When a man thinks of himself as an some distant place or wishes earnestly to be in that place, he makes a thought form in his own image which appears there. That's the first type. The second type is that which takes the image of some material object. The painter who forms a conception of his future picture and, um, builds it up in, out of the matter of his mental body and then projects it into the space in front of him, keeps it before his mind's eye and copies it down, basically being creative would be creating a, a topla of some kind. Let's see if there's anything else relevant here. Okay, here we go. The novelist, in the same way, builds images of his character and mental matter, and by exercise of, his, uh, exercise of his will, moves these puppets from one position or grouping to another, so that the plot of the story is literally acted out before him. This is exactly how I experience writing. Exactly how I experience writing. That which takes the form entirely of its own, expressing its inherent qualities in the matter which it draws around it. Those of which we here give specimens are almost wholly of that class. So this would be the the third grouping of Tulpa. This is this would be what people on Reddit and 4chan are experiencing, but with more input from the quote unquote creator, the pretender, the imagination or that picture right there is actually a thought form um, that is created from a specific emotion. Um, let's see. This was in the 1960s, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's supposed to represent the aspiration to unfold. Basically, a bird closing its wings is what it looks like, or wrapping its wings around something enfolding itself closing and this, these are just artists being creative that's all there is to it 
But the people on the r slash tulpas, if you can't tell, have really annoyed me. So, this is the most important part of the video. In Toronto, in 1972, the Philip Experiment was a group of people. They got together and they pretended, they, they created an, an imaginary friend named Philip. Um, the people who were part of the experiment... If you want to pause it, you can read it. But these are all people that have like sociology degrees and members of Mensa, which is a group of geniuses. Um, they got together and they created Philip. They tried to have quote unquote seances with Philip. They um, actively try to communicate this being that they created a mental landscape focusing on this mental landscape had his backstory, his, you know, his history, his personality, his relationship status, his friends. They knew every detail of his physicality, you know, every part of him. And they spent a lot of time writing about him and focusing on this imaginary being. And then they tried to have a seance and communicate with him as you would a ghost. And they spent six months doing this without any results whatsoever. But eventually he started, he started responding, knocking on tables. By the time they were done, objects were literally levitating themselves because Philip was levitating these objects. At least they believed that he was. This is through the combined mental energy of the entire group of people believing this being was real. And then him this mental construct levitating these objects. This, I believe, is a tulpa. They never worded it that way. They never talked about it in the form of Tibetan mysticism. But that's exactly what they were doing, was creating a tulpa. They use terms that are more, more commonly associated with the paranormal or, you know, ghost activity, such as a seance. But what they were doing was creating an extremely detailed tulpa that they were communicating with. They were getting responses from after six months of devoting a tremendous amount of mental energy and having dozens of these seances with no results whatsoever, Eventually, the table started moving. He started hearing knocks on the wall and knocks on the table. Um, the table would briefly levitate, lift up off the ground, and objects put in the center of the table would rise up into the air on their own accord. And there are videos of this. I'll share a video of this. Their, their goals were to create a fictional character through a purposeful methodology and then attempt to communicate, it, communicate with it through a seance. The character created and agreed upon was named Philip Aylesford, referred to as Philip during the test. His fictional history partially coincided with actual events and places, but with multiple contradictions and errors. He was born, and that, that was specifically done to make sure they wouldn't accidentally communicate with, an, with his spirit that actually did exist from the 1600s in England that was named Philip. They were trying to make sure that they didn't actually come in contact with a the spirit. They wanted to make sure that he was unique and they, they couldn't accidentally get into contact with a being that had a lot of the same characteristics, the same name, the same location of death, etc. He was born in 1624 in England, had an early military career and was knighted by the age of 16. He was involved in the English Civil War and became personal friends with Charles II, working for him as a spy. Philip was unhappily married to a woman named Dorothea and later fell in love with a Romani girl, a gypsy, who was accused of witchcraft and burned at the stake. In despair, Philip committed suicide at 1654 at the age of 30. So they just made this entire story up like you would a Dungeons and Dragons character. The only difference is... The, well, I guess Dungeons and Dragons is very similar to this because they have a group of people who are also creating mental images of 
the character that you create and projecting it into a mental landscape, creating a backstory. And a lot of them spend months and months with that character while playing Dungeons and Dragons. So, man, I wonder if a really intense Dungeons and Dragons session or group of sessions campaign could create tulpas. That's kind of an interesting thing to think about. Um, the group was seated around a table with initial stances yielding no contact, no communication, and no phenomenon. Owen changed test con uh, conditions by dimming lights and changed the environment to mimic that of a more traditional seance. Participants began feeling a presence. Table vibrations, breezes, unexplained echoes, and rapping sounds, which matched responses to questions about Philip's life. At one point, the table tilted on a single leg and other times moved across the room without human contact. Those videos are fucking crazy of the table just moving across the room by itself. Although audio, video, and witness accounts document the paranormal phenomenon, Philip was never, uh, never appeared to the participants as a spectral type ghost. The name of the X-Files episode that deals with this is a community of people, like a homeowners association, that created this being that would hurt or kill people who did things that the community found to be unattractive to their properties. For instance, you put up a, a bright blue birdhouse in your front yard. That's against the Homeowners Association. They create this mental image of this creature that would come and destroy the birdhouse and kill the people who put it up. Um, this is a pretty good episode. If you're familiar with that season 16, uh, season 6 of the X-Files, episode 15, then you will know what a tulpa is. Yep, that, that is it. That is my rant about tulpas and r slash tulpas and how I think most of these people are just depressed, lonely fucks who are hoping to fool people into believing they have a mental illness, which is a person who actually suffers a mental illness or at least has a mental illness, not always suffering. I really take offense to this, and I hope these people will find something that will take them out of this, this solitude that has created such a necessity for an imaginary friend. Just be happy with yourself. Be happy in your solitude. If you can do that, then you will get friends. But yeah, I will attach the video of Philip, the Philip experiment of 1972 to you guys so you can see some of the cool stuff that Philip did. I appreciate you for checking the video out and have a good night. Come on, let's get going. Have you brought Dorothea with you? Have you seen Dorothea lately? No. No. Would you like to see Dorothea lately? No. No. Didn't you love Dorothea in your time? No, no, no. 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 That was too... Oh, well, that loud is there. Look, please. Yes, we need them louder. Pull it louder. Pull it louder. Pull it louder. Pull it louder. Did you like Dorothea? Oh, oh, oh. Go oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Did you love... Margot? Margot. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Say it again. Did you love Margot?
Dumbledore had evolved a theory that if you trained yourself in a certain psychological skill, uh, which was uh, um, similar to the Victorian science room, in other words, if you sat around and you sang repetitive songs and you told jokes and you worked in a relaxed atmosphere... And got into the spirit and of the And got thing. into the spirit, literally the yes. spirit of the thing, you would produce these um, uh, physical phenomena, the raps and so on. And did Philip... And not you're, here? You're, you're jumping the little... That day, we've said, well, it's a physical phenomena. Why shouldn't it produce our ghost? And so we decided to try this. Now, it, uh, we, we read the literature very thoroughly, and there are many, many papers on it, and there is a, a philosophical reasoning as to why it works, and it's, this is too short a program for mm -hmm. me to explain right. it. But we tried it, and the first, the first um, sitting or two, we were a little bit self-conscious. It's not very easy. We're all serious, scientifically minded people, really. And to sit around and do all this sort of nonsense... Talk to a table. Talk to a, a table, much. wasn't there? We weren't at that stage thinking that we were talking to the table. Mm -hmm. We were surprised when suddenly one night we heard a rap from the table, quite a loud rap. And we thought, you know, what is this? And we sat there very much surprised, and I think it was Dorothy said, well, perhaps it's Philip. And immediately there was another rap. And so we said, well, um, rap wants the yes and two for no. Are you Philip? And there was another rap. And so um, this, this did surprise us very much, and so we carried on a little conversation like this, rather non plus the first time. Did you get movement and, then rather quickly? Uh, shortly afterwards, the table kind of slid a bit. Right. And, of course, then we all accused each other of pushing it, naturally. Uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, we, we couldn't believe that it would move. It really itself. happened? You couldn't believe and it yourself? We, oh, no, not at okay. first. And, in, in fact, the first few months we were watching each other like hawks, and uh, if, if anybody's finger moved the slightest bit, you're pushing, you know, this oh. thing. Hello, are you still there? Oh, no. Yeah. 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 He loves his beer, perhaps. Why don't you like oh, Philip, Philip, if you perform, you should have a nice big pint of beer. Would you like that? Good. Yes. Now, that was the loudest rap of the yes. evening. Yes. He loves it. He loves it. Yes. He loves it. Yes. 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 Oh, the circulation. Yes, a little bit louder. A little than that. louder than that. Let Alan hear that you want two bottles. Come on, Philip. Let me hear you. It. Let me hear you. There. Yeah. Here's the wrap. Right. 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 Now all hands are visible. Let, let's just dwell on this point. All hands are visible at this point. Yet the wraps are clearly coming from. It would appear certainly from within that table. Let's try it again. Philip, give us a good, loud, clear wrap. For on. one bottle of beer. Uh, louder than that. Come on, louder, Philip. Louder for two. Come on, Philip. Philip, if you want a bottle of beer, rap loudly. That is louder, Philip. Come louder. on, Philip, louder. Here comes the microphone. It has to be louder. Alan won't buy it. Come on, Philip. Come on. One. Right, I didn't hear right under the microphone, Philip. Right here, Phil. Yeah. Right here. Keep right here. Keep, no, he's doing it over here. Come, come on, Phil. Louder and on, louder. Philip. Louder. That's oh, better. Oh, good for you, Philip. You All right. have your bottle of beer. Congratulations, Philip. Having hauntings. The hauntings seem to be real, but uh, I have no faith in the departed spirits uh, theory. I think it's been the most exciting parapsychological experiment that I've ever taken part in. We've been interested in these physical phenomena for so many years, and I feel that at last we've made a breakthrough. Well, I'd first like to emphasize that this is an important experiment because it's done in a laboratory and it's reproducible. Now, from a psychological point of view, there are several considerations. First is, I have to ask myself, what are the psychological conditions necessary to produce this phenomenon? Now, it seems to me that the group is in a childlike creativity. This is brought on by the playing and by the singing uh, and the humor. The group lets their hair down, as opposed to the adult who says, um, this phenomenon can't be done because it's against the laws of physics. The child simply says, 
if I want to do it, it can be done. Now second, I ask myself, what does this wrapping and the table turning mean symbolically? Is it some type of concentration of energy or uh, is it an elaborate defense mechanism against some deep-seated unconscious conflict? Third, the group is involved in a, a joint feeling of mutuality. Each member almost intuitively senses the other person and their feelings. And as such, it has important overtones in various group programs. 